Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The presentation outline will discuss the definition of zakah, the importance of zakah, the conditions for zakah, and the people entitled to receive zakah. <coughs> now, Islamic financial planning, this is um, an area which, while we have the convention financial planning, it's always important to recognize and acknowledge that Islam is not oblivious to these aspects of financial planning also. So the way conventionally we'll financially plan something, Islam also recognizes and has rules for these things also. So we have savings, we have zakat planning, debts financing and credit cards, investment, the careful estate planning and etc. A lot of some of these things, for example, the careful, which is the Islamic alternative to insurance. Um, is, are things which are discussed in the MA Islamic Finance. Now, when we, when we talk about wealth management, we realize from the verses of the Quran and the ahadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how a person's wealth is always subject, even in the world and in the akhirah, to some form of questioning. So the way a person acquires his wealth, and the way then the person spends that wealth, a person will be questioned on these things. And because of this, this is how we can deduce that Islam recognizes the concept of wealth management. That how does a person protect his wealth and stay away from squandering the wealth? So, we can understand that discipline of wealth management from an Islamic perspective can be summarized as protecting, preserving, accumulating, and then distributing that wealth also. And this is a very important part of Islamic wealth management. That for a Muslim, it's not simply about how he acquires the wealth and how he spends on himself and his family. Rather, distributing that money to those in need is also part of wealth management according to Islam and Sharia. Ah. So if a person protects and manages his wealth but fails to disimburse that to those in need, then again this person is failing to fulfill one of the duties laid against this person by Sharia ah and Islam. Now, the distribution of wealth to those in need takes many forms. For example, we have zakah, we have the Sadaqatul Fitr, we have the Udhiyah or the Qurbani. And these are those things which are a person is obliged to fulfill. But apart from that, we also have the voluntary charity which a person should do throughout the year. But because today's discussion is on zakah, the history of zakah was that at the advent of Islam, nothing but believing in Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was required. The acts of worship were only legislated from time to time. So, for example, one of the first things that were, was um, obligated on the Muslims was to pray salah. Zakah, however, came much later. And this was actually, as we'll discuss, m several years later. So, prior to Hijrah, Zakah was only compulsory to those wealthy people who were close with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Medina Munawwara, only those people who wanted to give something gave something. It wasn't an obligation on all the whole Muslim community. And at that time, the obligation to pay Zakah was based on their, on their awareness, willingness and discretion. It, it wasn't a fardiyah per se, it wasn't an obligation as we have an obligation today. An organized system of zakah, for instance having the conditions for nisab, rate and hawl which we'll discuss, was only applied after the second year of hijrah. So the Prophet ﷺ received prophethood at the age of 40. He then migrated to Medina Munawwara at the age of 53, 13 years later. And it was in the second year. So approximately 15 years into Islam is when zakah was made obligatory on the Muslims. Now, the definition of zakah, it is considered to be a personal responsibility for Muslims to ease economic hardships for others and eliminate inequality. What we have to understand 
إذا زكاة زي أو زكاة زي duty on a Muslim because it mentions the Quran and the Hadith. But the purposes of the zakā, one of the main purposes is to eliminate inequality. And the elimination of inequality was something considered so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons that interest is prohibited in Islam and is such a severe prohibition was because of the inequality and imbalance it creates in the economy and the society. In order to bring the society in an equilibrium, zakah was one of the functions used for that. Zakah is one of the vehicles used to create an equilibrium in the, in the economy and the society. Now, it is an obligation for all those who are able to do so. For all those who to, to do so, as in they have the ability, inshallah, we will discuss that in the next few slides. Growth in goodness will increase, purifying or making pure of one's wealth. The, the, okay. the literal definition of zakah and the linguistic definition of zakah from zakah yasku means to grow. And in Arabic, non-Islamic literature, zakah has been used for the purpose of growth also. And pre-Islam, zakah, the word, the, the word zakah, yasku, was used for that purpose also. What is the relevance then to the technical term? Inshallah, I'm going to discuss that. Now, literally it means cleansing or purifying of something from dirt or filth. Praise, growth and increase. Now, the word zakah, yasku, it has two meanings. One is to purify something and then nourish something and allow it to grow, take care of it. Very similar to the word Araba Yarbu, which also means to nourish and cherish something and see it grow. Now, in Islam, the term zakah has been used for a spiritual purification resulting from paying zakah. So, how does the cleanliness aspect of the word zakah apply to Islamic terminology? Well, because a person who pays zakah is in effect cle clearing and purifying his wealth, number one, and secondly, also purifying his inner soul, his inner self, from things like greed and stinginess. So when a person is paying zakah because it is an obligation, naturally, the stinginess or not wanting to pay out to someone else who we don't even maybe know, that is being removed. And this is, this is how a person is inculcating sakha and generosity into his life. So that's how zakah, the lexical definition of zakah, applies to the technical term zakah as we understand it today. But when we talk about a technical term zakah, would any charity be called zakah? No, there's a clear definition in the books of fiqh and in Islam, which means that this is zakah. Legally, or from sharia, it means transfer of ownership of specific wealth to specific individuals under specific conditions. Now, religious payment made by a Muslim from his wealth or income or business or crops or animals in the form of money or crops or animals according to certain rates to the zakah collectors, that is zakah. Now, there's quite a bit of information in there. But all it means that certain people, once they meet the criteria and their wealth meets a threshold, they will have to give zakah. So specific individuals owning certain amount of money and then paying that money or giving that money to certain individuals. Now all these conditions are required for this payment to be called zakah. If the money isn't paid to the required individuals, for example, if the money was given to a masjid, that will not be called zakah. Zakah has to be given, given to the poor. Likewise, um, if a person doesn't meet the threshold, but they choose to give something, 
Then again, it's not called zakah, it's called a sadaqah. So the definition of zakah is quite important, especially when we talk about the distribution of the money which has come in. Because, as I said, the money of zakah can't be used for masjids. But if someone upon whom zakah is not obligatory gave something, even though they may call it zakah, can that be used for a masjid? It can because the conditions of zakat haven't been fulfilled here. Now, the importance of zakah, one of, it's one of the five pillars of Islam, uh, which are the shahada, the salah, the giving zakah, fasting in the month of Ramadan, and hajj. And being one of the pillars of Islam, the importance of this holds is, if a person denies the obligation of zakah, the person no longer remains a Muslim. So just so a person who says, I don't believe salah to be obligatory, he will leave the fold of Islam. Likewise, a person who denies the obligation of giving something in charity if the conditions are fulfilled will also fall out of the uh, fold of Islam. Um, what are the benefits of paying zakah? One is the obligation of paying zakah. But what are the benefits of paying zakah? These are those avoiding stinginess, encouraging donations, as a means to express thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and establish sympathy and avoid jealousy. So just the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated the Muslims to fast in the month of Ramadan and the purpose of that is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that a person may attain taqwa. Likewise, zakah has been made obligatory on the Muslims and among the benefits is to avoid jealousy, avoid stinginess and so forth. Now, zakah from the perspective of Islamic law. Zakat is an important duty for Muslims as mentioned in the Al-Quran. Keep a prayer and zakah. وَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاهِ Keep a prayer and pay zakah. While prayer is a physical form of worshipping Allah, Zakat is a material form. One of the interesting things um, in the Quran that we see is Zakat has been joined to the injunction of Salah in a number of ayat. In numerous places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoys, enjoins upon the believers to pray Salah and give Zakat. So just the way Zakat, Salah, and prayer is understood by all Muslims to be among the highest obligations for a Muslim. Likewise, zakah is not, doesn't fall short of salah in any way. Um, zakat is compulsory, Allah, in a, a take from their wealth, charity, to purify them and to cleanse them thereby and pray for them. So even in this ayah, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions one of the purpose of zakah to cleanse the believers from the inner filth which... Um, sometimes comes into a person's heart which is jealousy, um, stinginess and so forth. So when a person gives zakah and sadaqah, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً Take charity from them, from their wealth, تُطَهِّرُهُمْ تُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا By which you will cleanse them and purify them. Now, <clears throat> it is considered to be a personal responsibility for Muslims to ease economic hardship for others and eliminate inequality. Like I said at the beginning, that it's actually a duty upon the Muslim community to ensure that other Muslims aren't suffering. And one of the tools that have been used to create this equality between the Muslim community is through zakah. So while we have the obligation of zakah, it has its purposes. And among those purposes is economic equality. It is obligatory for all those who are able to do so. Um, in the hadith of, from Bukhari, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet said, whoever is made wealthy by Almighty Allah and does not pay the zakat of his wealth, then on the day of resurrection his wealth will be made like a bald-headed poisonous male snake with two black spots over the eyes. The snake will encircle his neck and bite his cheeks and say, I am your wealth, I am your treasure. Now, this hadith shows the severity of a person that doesn't pay zakah. Um, I'd just like to mention here also that after the Prophet ﷺ left the world, certain tribes came to Abu Bakr, the Khalifa, عنه, and said that we accept prayer. We accept prayer. And the other injunction of Islam. However, the injunction of zakah, we are not going to pay you anymore. 
Abu Bakr radiyallahu an, after discussing with them and answering any of the objections, then made a decision that anyone who fails to pay their zakah, then I as a Khalifa will make sure that we fight them. And the purpose is because they will have left the fall of Islam. If they refuse to pay zakahs on obligation, then they will have effectively left the fold of Islam. So even as a worldly matter, they are not considered Muslims. And in the hereafter, there's a punishment anyway. Um, like prayer, zakat is from among the basic principles of Islam, and not paying zakat is a major sin. Warning to those who refuse to pay the zakah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, those who hoard up gold and silver and spend them not in the way of Allah, announce to them a painful torment, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the day when it, when it all will be heated in the fire of hell, and their foreheads and their flanks and their backs will be branded with it. And it will be said to them, this is the treasure which you hoarded for yourself, now taste of what you used to hoard. This is again in the Quran alluding to the importance as well as the severity and punishment for those who refuse to pay the zakah. This is the hadith or the incident I was referring to. The first Muslim Khalif Abu Bakr as Siddiq said, By Allah, if they refuse to pay me even a bridle which they used to pay the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, I will fight them because of the refusal. And in the hadith by Abu Dawood, the Prophet said, Allah has made zakat obligatory simply to purify your remaining property. And he made inheritances obligatory that they may come to those who survive you. Now the main aims of zakah, obviously being a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ultimate purpose is the bond between Allah and his servant. And therefore to please Allah is one of the first intentions that a person must make when giving the zakah. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, O oh, you who believe, give of the good things which you have been, which you have earned, and of the fruits of the earth which we have produced for you. A second intention which should be made also, and among the benefits, assisting the poor and the needy. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of in Surah Al-Dhariyat, and their wealth and possessions was remembered the right of the needy. Meaning that those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising those individuals who never forgot the right of those in need from, among, from their wealth. So among the qualities of the pious individuals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this, that they always remembered the needy and assigned a portion of their wealth for the needy. And it acts as a mechanism to distribute wealth. And this is what I was referring to earlier on, that how it is the Muslim individual and the Muslim community's duty to ensure that other Muslim communities and individuals aren't suffering. And if they are, then it is a duty upon those who are able to do so to ensure that their duties are fulfilled and their poverty is uplifted. To purify one's heart and self from being stingy, meaning again the purpose and intention of zakah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, of their good goods take arms, that so thou mightest purify and sanctify them. This is a Quran ayah Now those were the uh, benefits of zakah and the Quran ayat and the hadith. But the Upon whom is zakah obligatory from a fiqh perspective? These are the next things, inshallah, we are going to discuss. Number one is Islam. Number two, sane. Number three, adult. Number four, genuinely owned, owner's assets or assets free of claims by others. Now, these are the conditions for zakah to be obligatory in a person. Now, the first three are... Um, simple that a person must be a Muslim, a person must be sane, and a person must be an adult. So there, are, there is no zakat for um, children. Um, I must say here, this is a Hanafi opinion. Other schools of thought have difference, a different opinion on this. So the adult issue, do understand that this is according to the Hanafi madhab. Um, the fourth condition, genuinely owned assets or assets free of claims by others. 
the condition here is that those assets which are zakatable, upon which zakat must be given, are those which are actually owned by the person. So what may happen is a person has possession of something, but it's not in his ownership. So for, so for example, if a person is borrowing a car of his friend, it's in the individual's possession, but not in the individual's ownership. So there's no zakat in this. Included in this is if a person has wealth which is zakatable, but the debts that he owes to others are more than his assets, then again, the assets will be considered as though they are they belong to others. Although it's in his own ownership, they are considered for zakat purposes to be belonging to others. Number five, productive assets. What we mean by this are assets which are capable of generating profit or revenue and net cash inflows. This is what the jurist term as al-mal al-nami, productive wealth. Now, productive wealth are those which grow in value. Now, the growth in value can either be because they are intrinsically growing in value, like gold and silver, or they have been assigned productivity in growth. And these are, for example, business goods. That once a person buys them, they are hoped, it is hoped that they will grow in value and the person will sell these goods as, at, a, at a profit. So because of the growth in value, they have also been termed as al malun nami. So zakat will be given on these um, assets and goods also. Um, so again, capable of generating profit or revenue and net cash inflows. Cash in hand are also the things which zakat must be given on. Cash at the bank, stocks, shares, bonds and securities, inventories of finished goods, rentals and net receivables. All of these things are termed as al malun nami. When we talk about net receivables, however, um, there is a difference of opinion on what, what actual receivable it is. Um, so, because it's quite detailed, I don't want to discuss it in this presentation. Uh, so, for example, if someone um, from the employment has not been paid for two months, and now their zakat date is approaching, do they have to include that amount and pay zakat on that or not. Um, these are, there are different scenarios for these things. Um, but, so I thought I'd just um, allude to it, but I won't, inshallah, discuss them. Um, surplus assets. Its value must equal to or above a, be equal to or above a minimum zakat ibn nisab, what we call the threshold. And full year's uh, possession, what we call the hawl, and fulfill the nisab, a given quantity for the period of an entire year. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm just going to sp spend a bit of time on this. In brief, what this means is that we have certain assets. Okay? So not all assets are what we call zakatable. Only some of them are. And they must fulfill the condition of productivity. There must be, there must be growth in them. So gold and silver intrinsically because they grow in value zakat will be given on them other assets for example commodities goods which are which are purchased with the intention of resale also fall under al malun nami because they are growing in value <coughs> other assets however don't fall under al malun nami for example a car a house um other furniture that we have at home. They do not fulfill the condition of al malun nami and therefore there's no zakat on them. So what happens is we have a nisab, a threshold. Um, approximately it's 250 pounds. Okay, There's an actual uh, formula of it has to reach approximately 612 grams of silver. If a person owns wealth which is equal in value to, the, to 612 grams of silver, then they are liable to pay zakat. 
So for purpose of ease, I'm going to say that 612 grams of silver is worth 250 pounds. So if a person's zakatable assets amount to 250 pounds, they have to pay zakat. What are the zakatable assets? Those things which fulfill the condi condition of al-malun nami. So th that is cash and the things mentioned in uh, point five. Gold, silver, uh, items bought for resale and other receivables which are all mentioned in point five. So it's only these things which have to amount to 250 pounds. So, for example, if a person um, has a house which he's living in, he has a car which he's using, he has another, other furniture at home, all of this amounts to, let's say, 200,000 pounds. But from those items which are zakatable, so surplus wealth and gold, silver, he doesn't have any gold, silver, he only has 150 pounds in cash and that's it. Will he be liable to pay zakah? No. So although the, the other assets amount to 200,000 pounds, they are not zakatable because they don't fulfill the condition of al-marun nami. There's no growth in them. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that it has to last in the, pers in the person's possession for one whole year, what we call the haul. But what must be remembered here is it's not required for each item to remain in the person's possession or ownership for one year. Rather, the way it works is, if on the first of Ramadan, a person's possessions from the categories which are zakatable amount to 250 pounds, we will say this person is now sahib and nisab Sahib and nisab So that's in first of Ramadan 2017. The following year, the first of Ramadan 2018, if again the person owns 250 pounds, then the second year is when he will have to pay zakah. During 2017, the first time he became the owner of zakah, there's no zakah to be paid. It's only the following year when a whole year passes. The following year, 2018, how much does he pay zakat on? He will pay zakat on the amount that he has in 2018. Irrelevant and irrespective, of whether half of that wealth or a portion of that wealth only came to his ownership one week earlier. So, if we take the scenario that a person has 250 pounds on the 1st of Ramadan 2017, he is now Sahib al Nisab. Does he pay zakah immediately? No. He'll have to wait one year. So, 2018, the 1st of Ramadan, he calculates his wealth. If he has 250 pounds again, he will pay zakat on the whole total of the zakatable assets. So if he has zakatable assets amounting to 10,000 pounds, then he will pay zakat on 10,000 pounds. Even if, if 9,750 pounds was only given to him a week earlier. So it's not a condition that the 10,000 pounds has to be in his possession for ownership for one year. It's a nisab which has to be in his possession for one year. Is the difference between the two uh, scenarios clear? Okay. So these are the conditions for zakah. I'm just, I'll just go over them again. The first three are quite um, obvious. Number four, genuinely owned owner's assets or assets free of claims by others. So if a person is indebted, then the amount to which he's indebted, he deducts that from his assets. He won't have to pay zakat on that. Um, number five, the condition is the assets are of a productive nature. So gold, silver, cash, bonds, securities, all of this falls under uh, those things which a person must pay zakat on. Furniture at home, cars, um, houses, watches, extra pairs of shoes, all of these things are not zakatable unless the person buys them with the intention of selling them, which makes them sellable goods. Then zakat will be paid, of them, paid on them because they are not productive. If a person has 100 pairs of shoes, 10 houses, it doesn't matter. He, might, he may not have to pay zakat if the surplus doesn't amount to nisab. Um, and then the condition is, he stays in, the possession, sorry, um, in his possession and ownership for one year. But like I explained, this is the nisab, the threshold remaining in the person's ownership for one year, not each type of wealth. 
um, and the full year is also there. Okay. This is just a summary of the previous slide. Okay. Uh, the people liable to pay zakah, Muslim, independent, independent meaning free, it's not, a person's not a slave. Um, absolute ownership, absolute ownership. So things that have been borrowed don't um, fulfill ownership. But likewise, um, money which a person may have, but this person is also indebted to others. So for example, if someone has uh, 5,000 pounds surplus, do they have to pay zakah if they have a debt of 7,000 pounds? Then although the 5,000 pounds which they have with them belongs to them, it belongs to them, but be because they are indebted to someone else, then there's not complete ownership on this wealth for zakat purposes at the least. Um, the fourth condition is nisab, that the surplus remaining beyond the... Um, needs of that person, so the zakatable assets amount to the nisab, which in our example I said 250 pounds. If it reaches nisab, then zakat will be necessary, otherwise no. Um, then we have hawl, which is a year of passing. And the last one is purpose of business, meaning those items which have been purchased with the intention of resale. So these are those things um, upon which zakat is given and the people that must pay zakat. Before. Sorry, brother. I don't know if this was an interactive session. Are you okay to take questions while you go through? Um, I'm not sure if that's no. is uh, yeah. No. Yeah, that's fine. Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so just one of the things that you said. Oh, actually, a couple of points. Firstly, you said if a person has ten homes, yeah, then he only has to. They're not zakat the assets because they're homes. Is, do you mean that in the sense that if he's got ten homes that he's intending to live in and he's moving around? Because I'm sure. You didn't mean if he's got 10 homes, one in which he lives, and nine that he holds as investment property. Because that would be an asset that you're okay. just looking to grow. Okay, the investment property, can if it's for sale, then yes, he may have to give zakat on those nine properties. But if the nine properties are for rent purposes and for leasing, it falls an investment, but they're not zakatable. But the rent that comes in, if that's then saved in an account... That would be zakat. That would, because that's cash. Okay. Because that's and, cash. And the second question I had was, you know, you went through Muslim, sane, yeah. adult, uh, and you mentioned different schools of thought yeah. uh, have zakat with children as well. Um, but we're, we're Hanafi, so we're going with that. <coughs> one. Um, I, I just want to, it's not as zakat is on the children. According to those schools, zakat is on the wealth. Mm. So irrespe irrespective oh, of who oh, owns that wealth. Yeah. yeah. So absolutely. it's not actually zakat on children. Um, but my question was, uh, what if, as a parent, you have investments in a child trust fund which are above the NISA amount. Uh, you don't actually have legal ownership of those because although you as a parent are putting money into that account, that account building and the child will have legal ownership at the age of 16 or 18. Um, does that, is that as a capable asset? It no. Is a saving, it is an asset, but it's not legally yours? Um, see, the difficulty with that is although legally it's not yours, because you've invested the money, okay, and it's for the purpose of your children, this will be considered as a gift to your children. But until, the, according to Sharia and Islamic law, the gift will only materialize as a gift once the children take possession of that. Until then, it's considered your wealth. So although legally, you are not considered, but Islamically, you'll be considered the owner of that wealth, and therefore you will have to pay zakat on that amount. Is that okay? Yeah, I mean... The purpose of the question was, say you had to sell some assets from the trust fund in order to pay the zakat on those assets. You couldn't physically do that because of the legal yeah, implications. Yeah. You can't actually access that money. But from what you're saying is, it's still your asset whether you can access it or not. Therefore, you'd have to find money from elsewhere yes. in order to pay the zakat. Yes. That for your yes. Okay, just to kind of, I had a couple of questions as well, but just to follow on from this question. Um, what if you were a child and your parents died, so you inherited a lot of money, right? Uh, and then, so at that point, who's going to pay the zakat? Sorry, repeat your question. So, so if you if you if your parents died and you inherited a lot of money in yeah. a trust fund or whatever it may be, um, and so, according to what you just said, is that you will not take ownership on that until 
uh, at some point in the future. Yes. So within that point, is that still the card? Uh, is that still the in that sense? The money. The, the yeah, the money you have. But it depends who yeah. owns that now. If you said children, uh, are you? Do you mean minors? Because you might not have. You might. You might be a child, but it might be a trust fund, so you might not be able to access that money because it's locked away. Yeah, th there's no zakat in there. Until uh, you actually take possession. So isn't that the same sort of thing to what? Well, in this case, the parents not. No, the, the parents. Right. In this case, the parents still alive. So, in his okay. question, that's what he wants. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Allah bless you, the barka in your life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, uh, the question I had while you were thought of, um, I mean, is zakat the primary purpose of zakat to alleviate? Um, uh, well, to, uh, to alleviate poverty, or is the prime purpose of zakat is to prevent people from hoarding wealth? So their primary purpose should be to invest that money. So that overall, as a complete economic you, system, you know, with questions yeah, like this, we have to always remember that when we talk about the purpose of the injunction of Islam, one is a purpose as a benefit. One is a purpose as a benefit, and one is a purpose because Allah has told us to do so. And we shouldn't mix these two things together. So why we say that the purpose of zakat is um, alleviating poverty and protecting or stopping people from hoarding, these are the benefits of zakat. So the fiqh of zakat is not based per se on the benefits. The fiqh of zakat is based on what, the, what we understand from the Quran and Hadith. So even if um, a person is hoarding wealth, but the conditions of zakat aren't found in that person, zakat won't be necessary. Um, likewise, um, with the uh, issue of alleviating poverty, that one is the injunction and the criteria being fulfilled, and one is the benefit. So when we talk about purpose, it's important to realize that one is a purpose that we are giving zakat because the condition has been fulfilled. And secondly, once that zakat is being given, now what are the benefits that we see? So I hope that answers the question. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the only, the only, the, uh, I was just asking in terms of intention. So, for example, if you're a Muslim and you've got money and obviously, are you thinking, ah, the higher intention here, according, uh, and this is why I was saying, perhaps, the higher intention in terms of what Allah is saying is, is to invest. So I should invest my money, not worry too much about the guy should be investing my money uh, to create uh, economy and where people can acquire jobs and whatever or, or should be thinking actually you know the high purpose here is to alleviate poverty so I shouldn't worry too much about investing that money I should be paying the zakat on it that, I mean I think that's yeah the, no that's the zakat would be given and um, this is what I was actually pointing out to that the in the benefits on when, when we say purpose if we mean benefits then the primary objective is the condition is found on me and therefore I have to give the zakat so whether that's alleviating poverty or not. So if, in a hypothetical scenario, um, there, was not a, there were people who were eligible to receive zakah, but they were not in dire need. So should you invest that money and create jobs and help the economy and so forth, or would you have to um, discharge your zakah? You'd have to still discharge your zakah because that's the injunction of the Quran. So although... Um, a person may argue that investing their money and helping the economy grow will be better than giving this person who is in a small need. Although one may argue that this one is better investing the money, a person doesn't have that choice because what's required is you discharge your zakah. So th that's, that's the... Um, um, if I can just finish the slides first because I think Adhan is going to be given in the next 10 minutes. Um, and then, if, inshallah, if there's any time, we'll have a question and answer session also. Now, the zakat recipients, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of those eligible to receive zakat in the Quran in the famous verse, in the Masadaqatul al Fuqara. And these are the eight um, areas where zakat is given. Now, zakat expenditures are only for the poor, the needy, those employed to collect the zakat, bringing hearts together, um, freeing captives, those in debt for the cause of Allah and for the stranded traveller. Um, an obligation imposed by Allah, and Allah is knowing and wise. This was the translation of the ayah in the Musadaqatul Fuqara al-Masakin. So eight areas have been 
designated to be eligible to receive the zakah. <coughs> okay, number one is faqir, one who has neither material possession, no means of livelihood, one who suffers and has no means to sustain his and her or her daily needs. Allah says, إِنَّمْ صَدَقَةُ الْفِقَرَاءُ and then al masakin The miskin is one with insufficient means of livelihood to meet his or her basic needs. And this is quite obvious that the main purpose of zakah is to help the needy. And these are the different types of needy people that we have. Um, and then we have the amil, one who is appointed to collect zakah and the expenses incurred in the administration of zakah. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself would appoint people to go and collect zakah from the different tribes in and out of Medina Munawwara. So they were also given zakah to cover the expenses incurred during their journeys and trips. Um, some organizations um, today um, act on this also and take out their administration expenses um, from the zakat also. Um, after the amil, we have wal muallafati qulubuhum, those whose hearts are to be reconciled and joined. Um, there were several categories who, who fell within this one category. One of those were those who had recently accepted Islam, but they were poor, or they were wealthy. But in order to ensure that they remain in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ would give them some, something from the received zakah. This doesn't really apply anymore, and this was the judgment of Umar radiallahu an that Islam has is now in an honourable state and is not in need of those al-mu'allafati qulubuhum. So this, according to the majority of ulama, this category has now been suspended. After wal-mu'allafati qulubuhum, we have wafir riqabi, those um, in the shackles of the neck. And in the time of the Prophet ﷺ and later, it meant those slaves who wanted to free themselves of slavery. So a person could give his zakah to the slave, um, whereby the slave would make a contract with his master that I will pay you X amount of money and you free me. So in order to assist these people and these slaves of freeing themselves of slavery, zakat would be given to them. Um, in Singapore, this category of recipients is spent on those who need help to pursue their education. Um, this is what some scholars feel that because a person who is uneducated is in the shackles of ignorance and therefore zakat can be given to him. Wallahu alam. Ibn al-Sabil, uh, stranded travelers on a permissible journey. Um, this was for, it may apply even today, um, but previously was always the case where a person had much wealth at home possibly, but they were in another city, another town, and during those days they had not enough money to reach back home or to cover their required daily expenses, so zakat can be given to them also. So although their poverty was temporary, because back home they had a lot of wealth, so zakat was also uh, permissible to give to them also. Um, whether this applies today, it can do so. It can do so. Um, if we've been for Hajj or Umrah, you see this all the time. Where someone comes and says, I've lost my passport, I've lost all my money. Wallahu anma the authenticity of their claims. Um, and then we have fi sabilillah, those who strive in the cause of Allah for the betterment of the community. Um, again, the condition is they are actually poor. Um, the poverty is a requirement in each category except the amil, except the amil. Ghadi um, mean one who is in debt but need as, needs assistance to meet his or her basic needs. So someone who's got an, a debt, can they take zakah? Well, if they are struggling to fulfill their daily needs and the needs of their families, then yes, zakat can be given to them also. Um, Okay, the discussion on the riqab. Um, some Muslim zakat organizations across the globe have only seven beneficiaries, since nowadays there are no more slaves. Um, 
six categories because al muallaf di qulubuhum like i said is according to the majority of the ulama has been suspended um, after the judgment of umar ibn khattab radiyallahu anhu um, being uh, the absence of slaves means that there are no, nothing to give in the riqab anymore still some other organizations which maintain the number of eight beneficiaries of eight people and they say that a riqab should be given and we should now those in the shackles of ignorance in order to remove them from the shackles of ignorance and educate them then the riqab can be applied to this category here due to that riqab is implied as zakat for those who would like to free themselves from ignorance for instance zakat paid to people who would like to further their studies okay um, before i continue are there any questions on the recipients of zakat Okay, that, that is going to come in the next slide. Is that okay if I do it in there? Yeah? Okay. Um, any other questions on the actual, these recipients here? How, how can you determine somebody's wealth? You have to give a correct person as a card. Okay, a lot of these organizations, they have um, individuals working in those communities, in, those, in their cities. Um, th they look at the person's life, what um, the person has at home, and so forth. Obviously, we can't be 100% ever sure that the person is absolutely a faqir or a miskeen. We exert our efforts and inshallah the zakat will be fulfilled. Um, Normally you see people who think, well, I'm going to give them some money, but I'm not sure whether I'm doing the right thing or not. Uh, the... Yeah, I mean, the organizations, they do, they do the required checks. So inshallah the zakat is, is fulfilled. Um, who cannot be the recipients of zakat? Non-Muslims, Relatives, uh, the parental due to duty of maintenance and inheritance. That means those relatives or those individuals in the family who are directly linked to you, the parents, children, and the husband and the wife. So these relations, you can't give zakat to. Brothers and sisters, yes. Uncles and aunts, yes. Um, cousins, and so forth, yes. But parents, children, and husband and wife, they can't give zakat to one another. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Brother and sister, you, can you, can, you can't give zakat to them. Alabama. Yeah, so you can't give zakat to them. Provided that the conditions are fulfilled, that they don't have the required funds. To the Sayyids, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for services rendered. So if um, someone washes you can't say, you know what, I may give you zakat. That's not so permissible. Okay. Um, because that's uh, a payment which you have to make anyway, um, apart from zakah. Um, to servants. Now the servants, remember of two kinds. Some of those servants which have made a contract with their masters to free themselves. Um, what we call a mukatab. But slaves who haven't undergone any contract... So they remain as slaves for their masters, zakat can be given to them. So a difference must be made between these two types of slaves. Uh, to a masjid. <coughs> and the reason you can't give zakat to a masjid because there's no individual who will take ownership of that money. And for this reason, you can't give it to wells, um, other organizations, um, as an organization itself. If the organization is collecting in order to distribute, yes, it's permissible, but to the organization itself, zakat can be given because Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا سَدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءَ and so forth. So individuals have been made the eligible recipients of zakat, not organizations and companies and so forth. So all the masajid, wells, are good works of charity. Zakat can't be given because there's no owner that will take ownership of the money given uh, to, pay, to pay the debt of a deceased person so to help someone in debt yes it's permissible but if the person has passed away and they have an outstanding debt zakat can't be given uh, to fulfill that debt uh, to pay for funeral expenses yeah you stop wage if somebody serving is needed yes because that will not be considered a hadiyah okay the amount that you can't include in zakat is what you have to give for services rendered. Okay. Uh, now, in conclusion, the benefits of zakat 
uh, for the society, strengthen the bond between Muslims, improve the society's standard of living. Uh, this also applies when uh, the zakat is being distributed within the community and within the country. So you see, over the years, over the years, you'll see how, inshallah, there'll be that equi the equality within the economy and the society and so forth. Um, for, so that's the benefit for the society, for the zakat payer, increases awareness, as, awareness and empathy towards those in need. Um, encourages a spirit of giving and caring because a person is actually calculating his wealth and then seeing how much he should give. So there's a, always, when a person does give the zakat, you always realize the need that, and you do shukr also of how, alhamdulillah, Allah has given us, and then also how Allah has given us the ability to help those in need also. So two different forms of shukr we see. Um, discourages one from being greed and miserly. It brings a sense of gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see three types of benefits here. One for the society itself, the zakat payer. For the zakat recipient, assists in providing work-life support. Um, helping them alleviate poverty. Discourages ill-feeling among the rich. Unfortunately, we, we do see this where those who are in need always feel that no one cares about us and so forth. But once zakat is being given and they are being helped, then the ill feelings that they may harbor towards the rich, that is also removed. Um, instills a sense of respect and care towards those blessed with wealth. For the wealth itself, it purifies the wealth and increases the multiplicity of the wealth. And this is also substantiated by the hadith that when a person gives wealth, it's actually a form of protection for the person's wealth. Um, okay, that brings us to the end of the presentation. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the to understand, um, appreciate the benefits of zakah, and give us the tawfiq and the ability to pay zakah, and bless us with the benefits, and bless the community with the benefits of zakah also. Um, just one final point I'd like to make about, the, about distributing zakat within the community. That if you feel there are genuinely people in need within the community, then it's always better to give them the zakat first. If their zakat is being fulfilled by several people and their needs are being fulfilled, then yes, by all means, go to um, other countries. But if you feel there are genuine people within the community, within the country, who are in need of zakat, then obviously they have more of a right of receiving your zakat. Um, uh, is the time going to be given at 7 o'clock? Yeah. Oh, okay, so if there are any questions, then <coughs> inshallah. Brother, just uh, another one. You said um, you talk about net assets. Yes. Um, there's always a, a, a iffy subject in terms of what you can net off in your wealth. So assuming you've got wealth of twenty thousand pounds, but then you've got an outstanding mortgage on the house that you live in of a hundred thousand pounds, that means you're minus eighty. Yes. Can you offset that? Because um, I've heard lots of different opinions. I've heard the house that you live in and the mortgage that you have. That's just that's what it is. If you have other wealth. That stands alone. You don't have. You, you can't net off a mortgage debt. Okay. Before I answer your question, because it's a going to be a long answer, can I just take his question just Absolutely. in case? Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about. Um, so what I don't understand what what's special about um, kind of putting cash into a house, and that house that you have. You got a house you live in, and then you buy ten other houses. Yeah. And maybe you're not doing anything. Maybe you know your, your attention is to rent. Now you know. You probably paid a million pounds to buy those other houses. Yeah. Now, um, originally you would have paid as a garden a million pounds yes. in cash, yes. and now you bought them to houses and you just don't take them out. You're just avoiding the zakat, and what you described. Um, you know, what, you know, is that is that the case? I mean, what's special about houses compared to other types of investment and yeah, liquidity? Yeah. 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 Okay. It's it's to do with um, those items which are purchased with the intention of resale, because. Now, also, although with houses, okay, um, you're going to have the capital gain on the house, okay? But it's about principle here, you see? Because if we apply the principle to that, then what about a car? So a person buys a car and his intention is to rent it and lease it out to people. Now, usually what's going to happen is the car is going to depreciate in value. So while there's growth in the house, there's not going to be growth in the car. So you're going to have two different principles, or you're going to have to have two different answers, although the principle for, the, for both is the same. 
So it comes down to principle, really, rather than all the understanding question. And from an economic perspective, yes, um, one may argue why zakat should be given on such a um, thing. And this probably comes down to your question earlier on also about the benefit and the purpose of zakat. So it's, it really comes down to principle. Okay. Um, you know, do you mind if I speak to you um, after the program is finished? Yeah? Yeah. yeah, because I don't want to delay the adhan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. Yeah. So. Um, any other questions? I uh, just got, I don't know if it's a quick question or not, but um, it's a sort of business related question. So, first part is um, do you pay the zakat on the profit you've accumulated over the year or cash in the bank of the business account? And the second question is is that do you pay zakat on the stock that you're holding at that time or the stock that hasn't sold throughout the year? No, the zakat is what the company owns. Okay. At that time. At that the time. Assets. The so assets. Not what you haven't sold. That the stock that is sitting there. The that stock that is sitting there for a year. No, no. Over the year. No, on the zakat date, yeah. whatever the company owns, zakat will be paid on that amount. But if you've got suppliers to pay, you don't pay on that value. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can deduct that amount because that's a liability on you. Okay. Um, any other questions? I had one. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, if, you, you, if, you, if you first off Ramadan, you have 250 pounds. Yeah. And then the following Ramadan, you have uh, 250 pounds. Yeah. Then you're, you, you fall within the zakat, even though maybe throughout that period you might have less or, or you yes, might have yes. more and yeah, you, pay, yeah. you pay on the, the greater amount. What if you had 10,000 pounds the first Ramadan, but come the following year and you only got 1,000 pounds now? Do you pay on the thousand pound or do you pay on No, the you only pay on the, what you own on your zakat date. At that moment. Yeah, so for example, if somebody had 10 million pounds on 2017, first of Ramadan, mm -hmm. but the following year, 2018, first of Ramadan, he only had 300 pounds. He only pays zakat on 300 pounds. Okay, so it's only on the amount that you own on your zakat date. Okay, on the zakat date, inshallah. Just another, it's, it's a very quick question. So you paid the card. If you got ten thousand pounds, you paid the card on that ten thousand pounds. Now throughout the next year, it's matured, so the total you've got is eighteen thousand pounds at that time. Do you then pay the card on the whole eighteen thousand yes. or yes. the eight thousand? No, eighteen thousand. Yes. Yeah, inshallah. So inshallah, we'll end now. Um, Jazakallah for your time.